and welcome to worship. It is good to be together in the spirit. A few announcements as we begin. Next Saturday is the Suicide Prevention and Awareness 5K over at Ridley Creek State Park, where we're gonna have a table for the church to hand out uh, flyers and, and to talk to people and to visit with the community. And then there's a team of people signed up to either run or walk or walk part of it and then go back. And um, any level of participation is more than welcome. It is uh, an outreach to the community. It is a visibility in the community. It's um, a show of support for grieving families here in our own community. So there is a place for you, no matter how you would like to participate, anything from baking cookies to sitting at the table uh, to walking or running with us. And then the next day, next Sunday, is our spring cantata. So everyone is encouraged to come be a part of that and consider coming in person because music is just not the same, I think, um, when you're not in the room. And then later on Sunday is the new member youth group invitational, which is a meeting here at the church, but one in which um, people that are aging into it are invited to come and check it out. But also, if there are friends you'd like to invite, it's um, a little bit lower stress day to come for the first time because there's a possibility that there would be many other people checking us out for the first time. And then keep in the back of your head that Strawberry Festival is coming because we'll turn the page on the calendar and it will already be upon us. So if you'd like to be a part of that or help in some way, be in touch with Mac. And then Joanne's going to make another announcement for us. Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all. Um, Spring has sprung and summer is right around the corner and our thrift shop is bustling with activity. So I'm here just uh, to put out a plea uh, for some assistance with the thrift shop. We're getting everything ready with new spring and summer items and there's a lot to do over there. Um, the thrift shop has new people from the community coming every week so it's exciting. The word is getting out. Um, and. As you know, um, the thrift shop is a, actually becoming a, a good contributor to the church's budget to make up for some of the deficits. So we would appreciate any help that we can get. There will be a sign-up sheet in the narthex after church. If you would consider just signing up for an hour or two, that would be wonderful. Um, there's jobs if you're not particularly um, wanting to be on your feet for two hours. There's certainly jobs where you can just be a greeter or a cashier or just uh, let people know what the thrift shop's all about. Um, it's a wonderful way to do community outreach. So thank you in advance. Are there any other announcements to make this morning? Yes, Diane. Oh, Diane needs little boxes for jewelry for uh, the Strawberry Festival in the continuation of the Ruth's famous jewelry table. Um, but yes, any little boxes that you have, please bring them in. Then let's spend a moment centering ourselves in prayer as we come to God in worship. Join me in the call to worship. Let us see you this day, O oh God. Come, Come to us, us as light. light. Let us hear you this day, O oh God. 
Come, Come to us as truth. truth. Let us sense your presence, O God. Come, Come to us as love. Come and let us worship God. We, we have come to rejoice in God our Savior. And now please join me in singing, Come, Thou Almighty King, which you can find in the back of the bulletin. For the gift of your creation. We praise you for the gift of our lives and thank you for all who encouraged us along the way, whether it was our parents, grandparents, and great grandparents, teachers, coaches, or friends. In this time of worship, add to the joy of those for whom family feels like a blessing. Bring comfort to those who are grieving losses and offer healing and peace to those who struggle with their families. Encourage us in the present moments of our lives with all their blessings and challenges. Refresh us with the new life you promise us in Christ Jesus, in whose name we praise you in the spirit praise within us. Amen. Please be seated.
this morning, we come before our perfect Heavenly Father as human, imperfect people. But leaning on that grace and forgiveness, we come with open hearts and honest about who we are. And so let's join together in the prayer of confession, which is found printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Jesus, who sat at the table with outcasts and sinners, we confess that too often our words and actions are not consistent with what we say we believe. Often we ignore the needy, show indifference to the lonely, and reject those who seem different than us. Forgive us, we pray. Empower and inspire us to reach out in love and acceptance through your name. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free to love more fully by God's generous grace. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. We offer our gifts to God in thanksgiving for all we enjoy in life, praying that our generosity will become a blessing throughout all God's precious creation. Thanks be to God. God.
creator and redeemer. You made us in love to share that love with neighbor and stranger as Jesus commanded. Take our gifts and make them tokens of your love we can share throughout our community and in the world you love. In Jesus' name, amen. And then please join in singing, Come Down, O Love Divine. and loving God. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to be together on the beautiful day. We thank you for the blessings of your word, for the blessings of your promises, for the blessing of Christ. We thank you for the opportunity to center ourselves in those blessings, to remember them and to be strengthened on our journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's first scripture lesson comes from 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 22. You can find them in the New Testament on page 220. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone <clears throat> who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins one, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. In order to bring you to God, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 
in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water and baptism, which this prefigured how saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Thus ends the first lesson. The second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, beginning with verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This, too, is God's word to us. It's really even kind of amusing that love or the wide range of what different people call love can drive people to do incredibly bizarre, sometimes absolutely cringeworthy, or even sometimes truly bizarre and awful things. And as a person who enjoys learning and a person who enjoys clarity, that wide range can sometimes be uncomfortable. People will quit their jobs and leave their communities and move halfway around the world saying that they are doing it for love. They will stop talking to lifelong friends that their new loved one doesn't approve of and drop out of activities and change their opinions on what they think about different things, saying it is in the name of love. Infatuated sweethearts sometimes will get a big, bold tattoo of their brand new love's name, sometimes in a very visible place, only to have to disguise it just a few months later. Women will go to great lengths to lose weight. They'll change the length or color of their hair, change how they dress their personal style for love. Alexei Baikov came up with the most elaborate wedding proposal I have ever heard. He hired a group of professional filmmakers to help him fake his own death. He arranged for his girlfriend to meet him at a certain time and a certain place, and he and the filmmakers all got there hours and hours ahead of time, so that when she got there, it was a disaster scene filled with wrecked cars and smoke and ambulances. And Alexei was lying there on the ground, covered in what appeared to be blood, and a paramedic told her that he had died. As she dissolved in tears, he hopped up and proposed. His theory was that he wanted her to see and experience how empty her life would be without him, to help her decide that he was truly the one. Really, that should have been the end of it. But instead, she married him anyway. Daniel Barrett went much further in the wrong direction. He was so much in love with his wife that he got very worried that she might be cheating on him, which she was not. After interrogating her, he punched her so that she fell to the floor near their fireplace, and that not being enough, he then hit her with the fire poker and then went to the kitchen and got a knife and stabbed her and then drug her body down and hid it in the basement under a blanket. 
then posed as her online for several days, chatting with her friends to see if he could find evidence that she was cheating, before eventually turning himself in for his crime of love. So-called love of Christ, that each of us define in our own way isn't always as different as I'd like, and we certainly aren't all talking about the same thing when we talk about loving Christ. The Crusades were waged for the love of Christ, and indigenous people living here were converted against their will and then used as a human shield for the love of Christ. Christ's name can be used as a weapon to puff ourselves up as better than someone else, or to suggest that disagreeing with us on one issue or another is really disagreeing with God, not just us. Someone is making money selling shirts that say, not turn the other cheek, not forgive and you will be forgiven, not all who live by the sword will die by the sword, not blessed are the peacemakers, not put your sword back in its sheath or pick up your cross and follow me or thou shalt not kill, but instead saying, and Jesus said, if you don't have an AR-15, sell your coat and buy one. And the shirt doesn't even paraphrase the entire paragraph of scripture that inspired it, which goes on to say that the disciples had two swords for the 12 of them and that that was enough. Swords, by the way, two swords would be enough. And someone else is publicly claiming that when Christ returns with a sword in his mouth, as predicted in Revelation, it isn't because, as Hebrews says, the word of God is a two-edged sword, but because Christ is going to shoot people with an AR-15 when he returns in glory, apparently with an AR-15 he's going to hold in his mouth because we're taking scripture literally, but not so literally that we can't swap out weapons. All for the love of Christ, but the love of a Christ who is no different and no better than us. It's hardly the reason, reasonable and creative problem solving that I would personally like to see. One that could acknowledge that we face difficult and complicated problems. One that would seek to preserve all of our American liberties, value human life, and read scripture with less cherry picking and paraphrasing out of context phrases. Again, lacking the clarity of indisputable interpretation I wish that we could have. If you reduce context to nearly nothing, you can find a phrase in scripture to say anything you want. There's a passage in Romans that says, shall we sin all the more that grace might abound? Certainly not. But if we chop out some of the words, it could just say sin all the more, which would be more fun. And then if we start swapping out words for other words to make it say something different, it could just be let's sin, even more fun but possibly less what Christ had in mind. Scripture offers a more beautiful definition of love than so much of what we settle for so much of the time. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And continuing in that spirit, but acknowledging it is not scripture. Love does not hit. Love does not lie. Love never asks you to pretend to be less than you fully are. Love doesn't like you better if you lose a couple pounds, go blonde, or wear a tighter skirt. Love doesn't like you better if you drive a nicer car. Life is not isolate. Love is not isolating. It doesn't hack into your accounts to see what you've been up to. Love doesn't play relationship games. Love never wants to traumatize you. It is never after your money, never wants to use you in any way. Love never, ever, ever needs to hide the body. Both in our relationships and in our faith, so much that masquerades as love, so much that is called love is really lesser or more sinister things in disguise that don't become love just because they wear that name tag. Even better, in this world where we define love each of, of, of each other and love of Christ however each of us sees fit, not surprisingly, Christ offers a helpful word and a beautiful example. 
Specifically, this morning's passage comes to us from near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He knew he was about to be betrayed. He knew he had made powerful enemies. He knew he was going to be executed. He knew that he was going to be portrayed by the authorities as a criminal who was a threat. And because he wasn't even fighting that argument, having a couple swords on hand to make it for them seemed good enough. And so he gathered his disciples together for a bit of a pep talk. He gathered them together to warn them that life was about to get pretty difficult, not just for him, but for them too. And it was going to stay difficult for a good long time. He gathered them together to inspire them to carry on his mission and to be his living legacy, to promise that through the power of God, even in death, he was not abandoning them, and then to entreat them, if you love me, keep my commandments. Whatever else people may tell us, whatever else we tell ourselves, Jesus tells us that loving him means following his commandments. And interestingly, the clarity I want, the wisdom I want, comes after that obedience. Obedience first. Love Jesus' way first. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then Jesus prays the Father would send us the spirit of truth. Love Jesus' way first, then an understanding of truth. And then the promise that we won't be left orphaned. Love Jesus first, and the proof that it is worthwhile will come later. The assurance that we aren't being suckers will come upon later, perhaps even before the feeling of faith becomes warm and fuzzy. Love Jesus' way first. Trust it will work out. Love Jesus' way first, so we are ready for the coming of the Spirit, so we are ready for God's presence within us, so we are ready to hear and understand and believe God's truth, so we are fruitful ground, ready for the seeds. Love Jesus' way first, like Dorothy, who for her own sake had to travel the full length of the yellow brick road before she'd be ready to invoke the power she had with her all along. Love Jesus' way first, so we are teachable. The first step is always to love in Jesus' way. Jesus, who never killed anyone but instead died for us, love never ever has to hide the body. If you love me, keep my commandments. This call was so much on my mind as I was reading this scripture passage and preparing for a funeral this week all at the same time. A funeral for someone who demonstrated day in and day out that we really can live as Jesus taught us. It's not a pipe dream or something we have to explain away that regular people can offer extraordinary love when we want to. And I'd like to share that family's story as a testimony and as a witness, and because I personally find it so inspirational. I'll share their story to wrap this up this morning. Many years ago now, due to terrible trouble in the family, two teenage sisters in our community were unexpectedly dropped off in front of our church's pastor's house, just dumped at the curb with their suitcases. And now Reverend Stewart had three boys of his own when he found these young ladies out in his yard. He was living in the manse over by the current ball fields at the time, but it hadn't been expanded yet to what it looks like today. And if you drive by and look at it and imagine the back part missing, it was small enough that it only had one bedroom and certainly one bathroom and certainly not enough bedrooms for five children and two adults. I suspect he was not making an exorbitant salary. If children and youth services had already been in existence, and I don't know if it was or not, Reverend Stewart had every reason to call them and say, oh my goodness, what a tragedy this is. And surely no one would have faulted him if he had taken them over to the Presbyterian orphanage that became Presbyterian Children's Village not 10 minutes away. Surely no one would ever have faulted him if he had called around the congregation looking for somebody with a bigger house or whose kids had moved out already, 
who might be willing to step up, but he didn't do any of those things. Instead, in faithfulness to our Lord, who called us to care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger, walking in the footsteps of our Lord, who took children in his arms and blessed them, in a choice of radical and self-giving love, Reverend Stewart and his wife took those girls in with open arms and raised them as their own until they were grown. One of those girls got a job scooping ice cream at the now defunct dairy barn, where she fell in love with a boy who was also hired to scoop ice cream. And eventually they got married. He got a better job. They bought a house and started a family of their own. But unfortunately, eventually, as a young lady still, she got very sick. Despite excellent care and many hospitalizations, she never got better. And some of the treatments that were meant to help her instead caused permanent damage. And this time it was her husband who made daily choices of radical and self-giving love like our Lord, who reached out to the sick and the suffering with compassion. He retired more than a decade early to be home with her, dropped out of community organizations to be available all of the time, gave up traveling, all without complaint or regret. This is love. This is faithfulness. This is truth. This is Jesus's will for you, and it is Jesus's will for me. Living and loving in Jesus's way opens our ears to hear the Spirit's whisper in the quiet of our hearts. It opens our eyes to see the invisible spirit already present and at work in our midst. It carves out a place for the spirit to live in our hearts when our hearts can otherwise be so filled to overflowing with other things. It prepares us to know and to believe that no matter how much the world lies and no matter what a mess we've made of things, we have not been left orphaned. And we will never be orphaned. And he is waiting for us in the end of all things. Amen. Please stand and join in affirming what we believe with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. A few joys and concerns as we wrap up. Prayers for the friends and family of Bill Moore, Uh, who we buried this week, especially his adult children, uh, Craig and Carol. Uh, Prayers for Carol Robinson, who's worshiping with us from home because she's having a particularly um, challenging weekend with her balance. Traveling mercies for Virginia, who as of this morning is in Indiana on a road trip on her way out to Colorado to see the new baby in the family. Uh, Prayers for Judy Shank, who's been struggling with so much pain and um, living difficulties. For Ruth Loomis, in the wake of her back surgery with just the uh, increasing and debilitating pain. And then for Bill and for Marion and for Ashley and all the health struggles that have come their way. And I have a message from Ashley that she sent to be included in the prayers this morning. She says... In her own words, I'm wishing all my church moms, Diane, Shirley, Linda, Virginia, Carol, Margie, and Joyce, a very happy Mother's Day. All my church moms are like buttons. They help me hold it all together with all their cards, hugs, prayers, and care packages. And happy Mother's Day to my mom. I'm so grateful for all the sacrifices you've made for me. Happy Mother's Day also to all the women doing it all. So we are also thankful for Ashley and praying with her in her ongoing treatment. What other prayers or concerns do we have this morning? 
Yes. Go ahead. Either way. <laughs> Do you want to go, Joyce? Excellent. So Joyce's cousin Brenda had her ankle surgery and is now doing well. Yes. For Tom's mom, who's still in the hospital, and um, but they still don't have answers to, for what's going on. And let us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this day when in our society we celebrate love, we thank you also for your love. We thank you for all of those who have had relationships with their mothers that have brought them joy, for those who have cared for them well, for those who are healthy and strong. And yet also on this Mother's Day, we pray for all of those who find this to be a more challenging day. We pray for all of those who have lost their mothers or lost children. We pray for those who were unable to have children. We pray for those whose family lives are complicated, for those who are separated from their families by distance or by conflict. We pray for all of those who are holding things in their hearts that they have not been able to share with others. We pray that this day of cards and flowers will not rub salt in an open wound. We thank you for your love that is perfect and without limits. And then we pray also for the strength and the courage to at least strive to follow in your footsteps and spread that love around the world. May we look to your love and your example when we are uncertain how to behave or what to do or what is called for in any given moment. We pray for those who are hurting or struggling, for those who are sick, for those who do not have enough money to get by. We pray for Joyce's cousin Brenda in rehab, thankful for the healing you've worked in her life and asking that you would continue to bring her strength and ease her pain. We pray for Tom's mom, as she's still in the hospital and has been in the hospital for such a long time now. We pray that they would find answers to the questions and be able to do something to help her. We pray for the comfort of your presence in the good news of the resurrection to be a help for all of those who knew and loved Bill Moore. In particular, Lord, we pray for Craig and for Carol and for their children. As they begin these days, as Craig said, he's never lived in a world that didn't have his father in it. We pray for Ashley, for Bill, and for Marion, for strength, for endurance, for healing. With Ashley, we lift up all of those who have loved her well and all of those who do the work of Christ in this place with faithfulness and humility. We pray for Carol, who's unable to be with us this morning because her health difficulties are getting in the way. We pray that Virginia would have a wonderful time traveling with family and to see more family. We pray for Judy as she struggles to have her pain managed and her quality of life improved. We pray for healing for Ruth as she faces frustrating pain and a difficult recovery as well. We thank you for all you have given us, and we offer our lives in return. And then let us join together praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Then please stand as you are able and join in singing our closing hymn, I Love to Tell the Story. that you might abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia and amen.